What is up, YouTube family? Thank you guys for tuning back into Wilburn Reactions. My name is Chad. If you are new to the channel, make sure you guys smash the subscribe button for me. Give this video a thumbs up. We are headed into another documentary. Or, yeah, I guess we can call it short doc. We can call them short documentaries, I guess. Uh, we are being on a roll with these. Um, yesterday was my daughter's birthday. That's why I took off. Uh, we were out of town. She did turn five. She is starting school this year. Very, very rough year for me this year for that. It's going to be tough. But um, we are headed into Carla. Corla. I think I'm saying this right. Corla Pandit. Um, and this is another artist. I actually like doing these now. Um, I didn't say I didn't like them, but the thing is, like, knowing about these artists, because I haven't reacted to this artist either. So it's cool to see, like, a story before them and then react to it, like, their music, because you know, like, a little background on them. But Elvis was, like, I already knew about Elvis, so I did Elvis first, and then we went into, uh, why can't I think? Why can't I think? Millie Vanilli. There it is. Um, and that was a crazy story. Like, that story was shocking to me. So I'm, I'm curious to know about this one um the greatest imposter is what this is um wow uh so we're heading down one of these lanes again but let's see welcome age of vintage society Call a pandit or known as the godfather of exotica he had his own tv show that ran in the 1950s and had an impressive recording career as well. He was rich, married to a white woman, and accepted in Hollywood as, well, an acceptable exotic. The only thing was, Caller wasn't what he seemed. Why was Caller Pandit the greatest imposter of the fifties? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. One of the icons of Exotica, Pandit embodies the complexities of the genre in more than one way. Pandit came to fame in the early 1950s when he appeared on a 15-minute show, Adventures in Music, on television station KTLA in Los Angeles. While he played some piece of Exotica like Jalouisi on the Wurlitzer, his face, topped by a white turban and oval jewel, looked like Orphan Annie's Indian helper, filled the screen, surrounded by a gauzy haze. His soulful gaze is said to have drawn housewives into rapturous fantasies. So, starting off early, is this like, did he is he just famous for this look from what I'm getting? So there's no like, is there a talent behind this or are we just going off of this image? So, I mean, I know we got, we're not that deep in, but I feel like like the starting of this, it sounds like we're just going into like an image that this guy might have upheld and it's like all right cool you know we're gonna because you have money and this look you know we're gonna give you a tv show and uh, i don't know let's see let's see if a talent comes in this fantasizing about being somewhere else isn't a new concept and as americans okay, moved into suburbs okay. that took boredom and conformity to new heights daydreaming about distant locales became a commodity Indeed, the suburbanizing 1950s featured a wave of music, glamorizing distant destinations in Asia and Oceania. Dubbed Exotica, based off Martin Denny's album of the same name, the genre featured musical interpretations of these seemingly out-of-reach places. While Denny may have popularized the genre, known to the masses as Call a Pandit was known the godfather of Exotica thanks to his television appearances. Sex sells, and it sells even better with a dash of mystery. For every housewife in mid-century America, the enigmatic charm of Indian performer Kula Pandit was the ticket to getting weak in the knees before the kids came home from school. In the 15 minutes allotted to the Kula Pandit program, the performer brought a scintillating new rhythm to suburbia's ho-hum beat. Every week he'd grace the small screen and play the sultry sounds of Mizaloo with a coy smile wearing a bejeweled turban and flashing those soul-searching bedroom eyes. It was all part of his shtick, of course, and one of the most strangest in Hollywood history, given that Pandit wasn't Indian but African-American. Today the persona he created opens up his race, fame and surprisingly flexibility of truth. Pandit let his music do the talking, literally on a Los Angeles-based television show known as Call of Pandit's Adventures in Music. Wearing a signature turban with a hanging jewel, 
Pandit played the organ while dazzlingly staring into the camera. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Okay, I, I saw like immediately after I made that comment that the organ, he was sitting at an organ or keyboard, of course, or piano, whichever one, even though. Um, and that, I was like, okay, so maybe there is a talent here. And now you're saying like on this show, now they say he played organ. So, but I'm still from hearing the the voice that is talking on this documentary. It still sounded like where his image is was carrying him. I mean, I got to hear some music, I guess, to get that part. But it seemed like this image. Obviously, he said, oh, he played the organ on his show, but he's gazing at the camera, and the camera's on his face. So uh, last time I checked, if we're looking at like a, a musician, um, we're focusing on the talent of the musician and not the look. Well, the look plays a part, but it seems like the look is his focal point. Like I feel like he can be like this terrible musician, but because he has this look, we're just going off of like, oh, yeah, he's gazing in your eyes. Forget what he's playing on the keyboard. Let's just focus the camera on his face. It was a forebearer of sorts to modern music videos. It doesn't sound very exotic now, but the mere presence of a man of Indian origin on the then new medium of television was very novel that is a in crazy the 50s. Organ. Not that Pandit was necessarily Indian, biographical details remain mysterious, although he said he was born in New Delhi. Although he performed some original music, much of his repertoire was in fact exoticized renditions of standards. In that respect, he was very much in the heart of the exotica tradition, which did not seek to present authentic world music as much as it did to dress up mainstream pop with mild world music influences, so as to be palatable to the middle American audience. Pandit recorded prolifically in his heyday over a dozen albums for fantasy alone, and in the late 80s and 90s made something of a comeback as his music was discovered by a younger generation. Interviewed for the Incredibly Strange Music, Volume 2 book, he has also given some live performances and had a cameo as himself in the Ed Wood film. According to the story Pandit told for most of his career, his father sent him to England and later the United States to be educated, and he eventually ended up as a student at the University of Chicago. He claimed to have taught himself the electric organ, then just beginning to become available commercially in three days to qualify for a job as organist with a Chicago radio station. That's crazy. I didn't even think back then in the 50s they had a, electric organs. I mean, I guess it makes sense, though. I mean, the organ does have the big fan, the big amp right there. So I'm guessing that's what they mean by electric. Cause I, I mean, that term is not thrown around a lot. Like, you know, electric organ. I mean, I know, I know they have some modern ones. Now, like, it's like a full electronic, which my dad doesn't like. Um, but that to think in the 50s they had those, that, that's, that's crazy and went on to hold jobs with other local stations. Like most everything in Hollywood, it was all smoke and mirrors. His charade wasn't his stage name, it was his race. Caller Pandit, born John Roland Red, was a light-skinned black man from St. Louis, Missouri. It was a secret he kept until the day he died. In order to garner the kind of success which would have been inaccessible had he simply played himself, in 1939, what? he became Juan Rolando, a man of Mexican heritage, and in 1948, he became Kaula Pandit, a Brahmin Indian. This just took a left turn. I, I'm thinking imposter. I'm thinking like he faked his musical talent. This man is faking nationalities. How do you get away with that? That that is crazy. I mean, I've heard. Of, I've, I've seen. There's a story like on a girl. Like I think she was like said she was. I think she was naturally black, and then she's claiming to be white, or something like that. But you're telling me this man didn't fake that he went three different nationalities. Like, how how is that possible? So he was light skinned and then he complained claimed to be of the Mexican descent. How how do you get away? Unless he was like moving because he was from a different country. Okay, does that make sense? So unless he was moving, and then when he came to the United States, I guess you can kind of get away with that because nobody really knows where you're from. But I mean, by looking at him, I mean, can't you? It is the 50s, though. I guess maybe they weren't probably like that in depth in looking at it. But, I mean, that's crazy. That That's crazy. I mean, I can, I can see you faking one nationality, but multiple is a little stretch. So, how did he do it, dear viewers? How did a black man from Missouri so he's become black. the godfather of Exotica? I mean, I, I take back well, what I just said. Because looking at this photo right now, I wouldn't have thought he was black. I'm not even going to lie. So, I, I guess I can't. I can't say too much and saying like oh how did he get away with it when i'm sitting here looking at him and he he really don't look but now that they have mentioned it i am now starting to see some black features in these photos and children john Rowland early on displayed a natural talent for the piano 
The jazz organist Sir Charles Thompson lived in Columbia at the same time and recalled that John Rowland was considered the best piano player in town. His older brother Ernest Red Jr. went on to lead one of the dance bands known as Territory Bands that played the black circuit in Missouri, Kansas and Nebraska. The Red family moved to Hannibal, Missouri before John Rowland was a year old and by the time he was two his musical skills were evident. From 1931 the Red family lived in Columbia, Missouri. Shortly after high school in 1938 John Rowland got his first job in radio with Central Broadcasting Company in Des Moines, Iowa. The next year Rowland moved to Los Angeles where his sister Frances Red lived. That year Frances starred in the 1939 all-black cast film Midnight Shadow where an outfit worn by Prince Alihabad played by actor John Kreiner inspired John Rowland to wear his trademark turban and oval jewel ensemble. Somewhere around 1940 John Rowland joined the large migration of blacks and whites from the Midwest to Southern California. He found work as a pianist and might have become well known under his own name as a jazz or R&B musician had it not been for his decision to bill himself as Juan Rolando at one appearance. Playing Latin tunes which were quite the rage, Juan found it easier to line up subsequent gigs than John Rowland had and passing as a Mexican he was able to join the whites only local of the musicians union. That is crazy! That is by, by far the craziest thing I've ever heard. So wouldn't they catch on that he was not what he's claiming to be is his race? If his sister, they just said right now his sister's black and he moved where she was. Unless you're claiming like half brother and half sister. I mean, I'll put two and two together and say, um, I'm pretty sure his name is not Juan, first off. And if his sister's black, where are we getting this? I mean, I guess you could say he's talented. I mean, I wish they showed in the video that, I mean, what he plays on an organ or piano or whatever, so we can see what kind of talent, like, at least see what kind of talent he had. But I am so confused how he got away with changing over so many times. I'm thinking, like, he went from where he was from to the United States. Then, but you're saying he went from where I forgot to, to L.A. I mean, I mean, I guess. I guess back then in the 50s, I got to go back to the beginning of the 50s. Now, word of mouth is how, like, news travels probably back then, I'm guessing. They didn't have the modern stuff we have. So I guess I could see him kind of getting away with it. But that is, that is some strange stuff, y'all. His reputation grew, and he moved from clubs to theater appearances. And, and even kids landed a job playing on the Shandhu, the magician radio show. He also met and began living with a white woman, Beryl de Beeson, who worked as an animator at Disney. The couple got married in Tijuana, Mexico on July 21st, 1944 as mixed marriages were still not allowed in California at that time. They had two sons. One Rolando also aired on radio station KMPC and on Jubilee, an armed forces radio service show that specialised in playing black jazz and swing band music aimed at African-American military personnel overseas during World War II. The Zoot Suit Riots of 1945 climaxed a growing conflict between the white and Mexican populations in Los Angeles and may have had something to do with John Roland Red's decision to mutate again from Juan Rolando, Mexican, to Caller Pandit, Indian. Juan Rolando became Caller Pandit. Gosh, I think it's just getting me now. Now he's in his Indian form. This is crazy. I, I, I got almost like to the point I don't even want to pause no more. I just want to see the outcome, like the ending of this story. Like who caught on to this man changing his identity? I think first off, his wife probably had to be in on it because I mean, if 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 he was with a white woman, right? I mean, them kids had to come out with some type of complexion, some color here. I mean, that that I think that's going to be a call right there to be like, okay, if you're claiming this, but he's claiming Mexican, Indian, and black. So, I mean, the kids... I don't know. It's just so many red flags here. It's it's so many red flags. On June 28, 1948, on a radio show called Chandu the Magician. In February 1949, Call of Pandit's Adventures in Music debuted on television station KTLA in Los Angeles, where Pandit played the organ and piano, sometimes simultaneously. The handsome young man in the turban didn't speak, only gazed dreamily into the camera, an effect that proved mesmerizing 
as Pandit became an I overnight figured. sensation. I was going to ask that. Wouldn't he have to have like an In any case, by 1949, he could be heard on Hollywood Holiday, a radio show broadcast from a local restaurant. He and Beryl had also married after California's law against mixed marriages was struck down in 1948. Along with his new identity, when his jewel-topped turban, which Hollywood had already turned into an icon of its own kitschy fiction of oriental culture, despite the fact that Sikhs, not Hindus, wear turbans, and even then without any ornamentation. The show was unlike anything seen before, not that that couldn't be said of many shows at the time. A bright, luminous light filled the screen, eventually fading to a shot of Pandit's hands on the keyboard as he played his original theme, Magnetic Theme. Pandit never spoke. Instead, viewers watched alternating shots of Pandit's face, Pandit at the organ, and Pandit's hands, with occasional shots of a company of exotic dancers. At times he played both organ and piano simultaneously, one hand on each keyboard. Much of the time the camera stayed on Pandit's face as he gazed soulfully into it. That's weird. Born at a time when a black man in the South could get whipped for making eye contact with a white woman, Pandit was making dreamy eyes at thousands upon thousands of aproned homemakers, stealing into their dens as they heated their fondue pots. Pandit quickly became one of the early celebrities of television. He and Beryl bought a house in the Hollywood Hills, and he could be seen partying with the likes of Errol Flynn. He had also adopted an English accent and a strange manner of speaking that always stayed at vague, apparently spiritual level. His nephew, Ernest, recalled that it got to a point he didn't even speak very good English because he had taught that Hinduism, or what you call it, for so long. I was going to ask that, because I'm like, I mean, switching between nationalities, once again, I mean, he had to have some type of accent, right? So he had, when he went to whatever, I forgot, I can't remember all the names, but when he went to the Mexican descent, obviously you got to have some type of accent, and then you're going to the Indian descent, obviously you got to talk like you have, you're part of that culture, but you said most of the time he didn't talk. I mean, he just had to be good then. I, I, that's the best way. I mean, to get away with all this, he just had to be really good. That is crazy. I mean, obviously, it's, it's similar. Like I said, I haven't heard his music. They haven't showed anything on it. But obviously, he had to be some type of good, right, for him to become famous. I mean, he could not have got famous by just gazing at the camera and looking at people because of his eyes. Is he that good looking of a man that he could just stare at the camera and that's what we getting away with? Like, it doesn't. That don't, that's not a talent. I mean, the camera's just on his eyeballs. That, that doesn't even make sense. By 1951, Pandit had a national audience, producing some of the world's first music videos known as telescriptions. Contractual problems followed that resulted in replacing Pandit with the up-and-coming pianist Liberace in 1953. Despite this, Pandit was so popular among San Francisco viewers that in 1957 a local poll found him the local personality most deserving of national recognition. Bay Area label Fantasy signed him to a contract, and he recorded an eye-watering 13 albums in just three years. By that time, however, Pandit had begun to break his silence on his shows, and to speak about what he called the universal language of music. This hodgepodge of genuine and ersatz mysticism caught on with a small portion of the audience, that slice of California demographics that fostered its reputation as the land of fruits and nuts but most viewers preferred their music philosophy-free, and by 1961 or so, Pandit left the airwaves, at least as far as live performances were concerned. For most of the next two decades, Pandit focused on theatre appearances, he got distribution rights to his albums, and was selling them at shows long after Fantasy stopped releasing them. Eventually, the house in Hollywood Hills was traded for a tract house in Vancouver, Canada, his venues shrunk along with his audiences. Large theatres were replaced by retirement homes and pizza and pipes restaurants. Eventually he left his home with Beryl and became something of a drifter, moving from girlfriend to girlfriend, sometimes in his own place, so sometimes nice crashing on a friend's couch for months. His polished and enigmatic style never changed, though, and eventually he was rediscovered by a new generation of fans with a resurgence of interest in lounge and exotica music. He appeared in the 1952 film Something to Live For, and again 25 years later in Richard Pryor's comedy Which Way Is Up. 
director Tim Burton gave him his last movie role, as himself, of course, in his 1994 movie Ed Wood. By playing off the cultural ignorance of the American people, of course, all John Rowland Red had to do was slap on a turban and voila, instant Indian. He also invented a fantastic backstory and liked to talk about spirituality and peace. What's not to love? It really couldn't be too hard to fool us as people. We'll believe anything if it feeds into cultural stereotypes. The truth the is... Two, then when he, uh, I, I didn't even think that deep. That, that just brought up uh, something to my attention is... I mean, he would have to go along with the religion aspect of it too. I mean, if you're going to play in this part, I mean, you got to somewhat know the religion aspect of it and, and somewhat give the people... I mean, faking that is even difficult. I mean, he just... Uh, now I see probably why he had acting roles. He probably was good. I mean, he was acting his whole entire life. So, I mean, an acting role wouldn't have been difficult to even comprehend. But it's like, this dude is, he, he had the luck of the draw because he can fall off. And it seemed like he was still getting movie parts and doing stuff like anywhere he moved. So he was still able to do something even when stuff was falling apart. This Red's whole act was one big stereotype, including the turban with the shiny gem he always wore. He claimed to be a Hindu, but Hindus don't even wear turbans. That's a Sikh custom. But why quibble with details, America? So we didn't even question In the 1970s, Pandit, no longer on television, continued to record and perform for fans and play the organ at silent movie revival houses. Pandit last performed in Los Angeles in February 1997. He died in Petaluma, California on October 2nd, 1998. He was 77. Caller took his secret with him to his grave in 1998, and he is now celebrated posthumously as the first black entertainer to have his own TV show. I mean, should he? Amazingly, over the show's 900 episodes, he didn't speak a single word, yet captivated his daytime audience of housewives with his hypnotic gaze and his theatrical performances of popular tunes and East Indian compositions played on the newly developed Hammond B3 organ. It really is a fascinating story, especially considering how bold Red was with his deceit. He wasn't going to quietly pass. He wanted a big life as a musician, and this ethnic farce was his way to get it. And apparently, he played it out until the end. He made it So, his dear life. viewers, what do you think of Call a Pandit? Do you think black people knew his secret? If you liked this... They probably... I don't know, because I'm... I, okay, I'm looking at him, and... Before they even mentioned that he was black, I mean, I wouldn't have guessed. But, I mean, these images are in black and white. I mean, but is it really right to say he's the first black? I mean, I don't know if they said first, but is it really right to say that he's the first black to be on TV like that? Like, he didn't claim black. So, I mean, do we really give him that praise? So, we're really celebrating this man for not even claiming his own nationality. But we're giving him that platform i don't think he deserves it i i really don't i mean he said he was hindu latin the latin community like he played every community there was and we're, we're giving him credit for something he didn't even claim i mean he made it through his whole entire life being something he wasn't he was an imposter his whole entire life he died being an imposter see i thought this story was gonna end like he got caught you know his life fell apart I'm not wishing bad on nobody but I, i'm I, that's where i thought this story was headed you know the world found out his kids grew older they had some color and they found out he was black and blah, 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 his music. No, this man went to his grave living an imposter's life and faking being something he wasn't. And now he's being praised for being black and he wasn't even claiming black. This is crazy. This is the craziest documentary I've seen out of all the documentaries you guys have seen. This is by far the craziest one. This man didn't get caught till he died. So he took, that's the definition. So this man probably created that definition of take it to your grave. Because he did it. He died being something he wasn't. That is wild. Now I need to know like where his kids are today. Like I, I gotta, I gotta know. Like this is crazy. Wow. I thought he's gonna get caught. I did not think this story was ending like this. This man went to the grave faking it. I need to hear his music now. Now I gotta hear the different music he put out there. The black side, the Latin side, the Hindus. I need to hear it all because... He got away because a lot of his stuff he didn't sing. He was just up there. So what does his acting consist of? Like, I, I'm confused. Like, he was an actor for this amount of time, but he didn't talk. So what did he do? We just looked, looked at this man's face. Was he that gorgeous of a man that the camera just panned on this man's face? And we just let that go. 
I mean, he must have been great looking for that to be the reason why he got famous. Because that is by far the craziest thing I have ever heard in my life. Like, oh, he didn't talk, but we just put the camera on his eyeballs and his face. Wow. Let me know what y'all thought about this one. This one is by far the wildest. I thought Millie Vanilli was something. Millie Vanilli was still still up there. But this story, I think, takes the cake. I, it's going to be difficult to beat this crazy story. Let me know what y'all thought about this one. I, I need discussions down below because I am blown away by this guy.